So in the interest of time, I think we're going to go ahead and get started and then people can join us as they join us. Um, before we get into the programming, I do want to do a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'm an Indigenous person by way of Canada, uh, but I'm a settler on these lands. And Colorado occupies the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, Eastern Shoshone, Hikaria, Hapachi, Pueblos, Diné, Comanche, Lipan, Apache, Osage, Kiowa, Pawnee, and Osheti Shekwin peoples. In offering this land acknowledgement, I ask us to recognize the state sanctions act, acts of violence, uh, displacement, and dispossession against the original and rightful inhabitants of this area and the challenges Indigenous communities face today as a result of the past and current colonization. I also want to respectfully acknowledge the generations of stolen and enslaved Black people and their descendants who have built and continue to build this country that we now occupy, as well as the violent history of U.S. colonization and imperialism that has displaced generations of people from their ancestral lands abroad. I also want to recognize the longstanding systemic racism, including economic and environmental injustice, which has created conditions that continue to disproportionately impact marginalized communities across Colorado and beyond. As a first step towards accountability and reconciliation, I ask that we commit to knowing this knowledge or in this history and honoring our collective ancestors who stewarded the land and protected the species native to it long before we came. I ask that we collectively learn to respect, trust, and affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, knowledge, and experiences, and pledge to support the land back movement and reparations in any way that we can until such time that the land is ceded to its rightful stewards and all marginalized communities are treated equitably with justice at the forefront. And just like our Colorado species won't be helped by simply acknowledging the threats that they face, we need to take action. So I ask every anyone who has any actions to offer, um, if you could drop it in the chat, any actions that you're aware of to help um, Indigenous folks on the lands that we occupy. Specifically, um, I'm going to ask everyone to take action to support the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes proposal to rename Mount Evans to Mount Blue Sky. I'll drop that link to the chat. I also ask that uh, people with means uh, support Spirit of the Sun, which is a local Indigenous nonprofit. Spirit of the Sun recognizes that climate justice, environmental justice, and racial justice are not separate from each other. Uh, but that the fight for one is the fight for all three. So please help support their programming with a donation today if you're able. I'll also drop a link to that in the chat. And this week I, um, I heard from a Pawnee elder who suggested that we also remember that uh, tribal co-management of federal lands is a possibility if we make it a possibility. So I don't know if anyone else does it, but when I write my comments to uh, the Bureau of Land Management or um, the Forest Service, I always say land back, but maybe I can say uh, tribal co-management of federal lands instead. So if you have any um, direct actions that you think people should take, feel free to drop that in the chat. And thank you so much for giving me the space and time to um, do that land acknowledgement. So uh, before we start with the programming, we're gonna do a little bit of introductions. Um, we're gonna do name, pronoun, organization, and then a short uh, visual description for those who may be low or no vision or maybe on the phone call or the phone with us today. So I'll start. My name is Chris Talbot Heindel. My pronouns are they, them. I'm the communications and membership manager at Rocky Mountain Wild. And for a visual description, I'm a light-skinned mixed race person with tons of freckles, just covered in freckles. I have um, shoulder length, salt and pepper hair. I'm wearing a purple hoodie today, um, black headphones, and I've got a shoji screen in the background. So I will pass it on to Beth. I forgot to unmute. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a thank you for having me, Chris, in, in Rocky Mountain Wild. Uh, my name is Beth Pratt. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I am the Regional Executive Director for the National Wildlife Federation for California, or P22's BFF. Um, I want to acknowledge where I'm sitting is the traditional homeland of the Southern Sierra Miwok. Where the crossing is located is the uh, homeland of the Chumash. Both uh, are pursuing federal recognition, so I encourage folks to support those initiatives. Um, and for a visual description, uh, I have a sort of dirty blonde hair, 
I am sitting in my office. It looks like books are about to fall on me. And I have a t-shirt on with P22, uh, the hero of the story I'm about to tell. Every time I see Beth, I wanna just go sit and hang out there for a weekend and read all those books. Um, my name is Michelle Corden. I am Colorado Parks and Wildlife's Wildlife Movement Coordinator. It's a relatively new position. It's a statewide position. I am um, up in the Northwest portion of Colorado is where I reside. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I am, um, I have brown hair and light skinned I have on a blue shirt today and in my background, I have a picture of a fox with our um, Colorado Parks and Wildlife 125th year anniversary logo. And it says live life outside. Thank you for having me. Great, and before we go into the presentations, I want to, uh, kind of point everyone to some resources at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, there's a live transcript option if you need it. Um, it's not accurate, but it, it, uh, if, if, if it helps, um, it is there. And then we also have reactions. Um, so if you feel so inclined, you can go ahead and um, use a reaction as we go through. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to use the chat liberally. Um, we're we're going to save kind of the, the question and answer portion to the end so that, that so that we can get through the presentations. Um, so feel free to um, write any questions that you have in the chat as we go along. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Beth. Thank you so much again, Chris, for having me. Oop, and I just, what did I do? Sorry, I just locked my computer by mistake. Um, <laughs> gonna transition to presenting. So I'm gonna talk about, I'm in celebratory mode, also trying to get over exhaustion because we just broke ground on the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. So um, it's, it's gonna be really fun to do this presentation and let me share my screen. Let me make sure that technology is working. All right, here we go. Um, but just by way of introducing myself, because I feel like, um, you know, I have two worlds that I've been operating in in most of my career. And most of it has been in places where you see on the left, there's me in Yosemite National Park. I worked in Yosemite National Park for a decade. I worked in Yellowstone for four years. But the last 10 years of my life have been spent on urban wildlife conservation, which I honestly didn't even know was a thing until I got involved. Um, you know, this is where uh, I, I do a lot of work up at uh, 10,000 feet. I study alpine animals such as the Yosemite toad and the bear and butterflies that fly over 10,000 feet. And then perhaps my favorite animal, uh, the pika. I'm bummed our wildlife crossing does not have pika, but I know some do. Um, but this is the other world that to me is just as worthy as urb, uh, of conservation efforts, which is the city of LA in all urban areas. And this you know, for me, it was quite a game changer um, that I'd be marching around near the 101, one of the busiest freeways talking about mountain lions. I never would have foresaw this, but I've come to see that this is the future. It's not that we don't stop putting aside places like Yosemite or Yellowstone or Rocky Mountain National Park, which is one of the first, it was the first uh, Western National Park I visited when I was uh, 17 years old. Um, but we have to also expand our idea of where wildlife should be because they're not gonna have a future. And that's something that, you know, when I got started in conservation, we didn't really think about, right? We, we thought about, you put aside a Yosemite, you put aside a Yellowstone, you put aside a wildlife refuge, check the box, wildlife saved. Well, we now know, cause this is what's great about science. We knew, we know we were wrong. We wanna keep putting aside places where wildlife have primacy, but they need to be able to move across large landscapes and to have connected landscapes, even if they're not moving across all of them for it to be successful. I think California is a great example. And um, there's 
lots of open space in California. You know, get over that it's this, you know, highly populated state. It is, but it's also the almost the entire length of the Western seaboard. So we have a lot of open space here. You know, I grew up in New England, not as much open space there with, you know, probably if you look at the whole seaboard, just as many people. Um, but the problem is here, it's not connected. And that's what we're seeing with these impacts, large and small, that are devastating to both wildlife and ecosystems as a whole. My first introduction to this was Mary Ellen Hannibal's book, um, The Spine of the Continent, um, which really detailed that path of the pronghorn. And it was like an aha moment for me. Oh, right. You know, even if you have a protected space for animals, you're going to need to be able to work across the landscape. And that means in peopled spaces. Uh, and of course, in LA, this is the mountain lions trying to move across, you know, the legendary freeways. Here's a bobcat making, you know, urban spaces. Here's coyotes in downtown LA. And I think this is what's important is the animals are adapting or trying to. It's us who have to get over that they shouldn't be here. You know, I probably would have cringed at this photo 20 years ago. Now it's like, great, you know, okay, let's just see how we can get them across the road better. Um, and this is all over the world. I, I, I wish we had hippos in California. That'd be a fun one. Um, Sandhill cranes, emus, elephants, right? I, I would love to work on an elephant crossing someday. Penguins, right? I mean, animals all across the world are needing to navigate our roads and our landscapes in ways that we really didn't think about before. But again, now we know, and now we can do something. And this is one of my favorite sort of crossing moments where two deer needed to get across the Golden Gate, I guess, because they wanted to go to Marin for the weekend, like all of us. Um, and, you know, traffic slowed down for them, which was great, but we know that usually doesn't happen, right? The, this usually ends badly for the wildlife. I also like to point out, it's not just the big guys. That's a little Western fence lizard on Mulholland Drive in LA trying to get across the road. I did relocate him to safety, but, you know, the, the enormous toll that our roads take or our development or anything takes on wildlife, I don't even think we've grappled with. And I really want us to think of connectivity, not just in terms of roads. Take 15 minutes, it's the best 15 minutes you're ever gonna spend and watch this video, tadpoles, the big little migration. It'll change how you feel about tadpoles, but also just think about if you're boating or swimming in a pond, what it does to wildlife. I'm not saying we should give up these activities, but we have to start thinking about even recreation differently, not just driving. Um, we have butterfly migrations here and in, in where I live in Yosemite, as I'm sure you do where you live. Takes I, I feel like a mass murderer when I'm driving down the road those days. And again, even trails, there's a, tra a monarch butterflies are uh, obviously having a hard time everywhere, but California especially. And there's a trail where mountain bikers go a lot uh, that I'm worried about. I love mountain biking, I'm a mountain biker, but how do we, look at how we do recreation differently to make way for wildlife as well. And that means sometimes making some difficult decisions. Here's another example of our trails impact. Again, we didn't know this at the time. We thought, okay, we put a trail in and you know, plenty of open space on either side, but not all trails are equal. And this is a, um, a, a Sierra Newt that was mushed by a mountain bike as well. So Maybe we close the trail certain times to even sometimes all activity. I don't mean to pick on mountain biking again. I love mountain biking, but activity comes with impacts. That's how I, I look at it. And I think that gets into this connectivity story that I want us to really think differently about. And this gets at everything, fences in your yard, lights in your yard. Light pollution is an enormous impact to connectivity, especially for birds and bats and other creatures. And then I can't think of any better example of just, you know, uh, putting in something without any attention to the impact on wildlife to say nothing of people, but here is a wildlife example of just cutting off, you know, these thousand plus year roots for wildlife uh, has an enormous impact on. I also just want to take a moment and talk about water again, like the tadpoles. I won't play this video, but this is shipping routes that impacts whales and how they feed. So again, we just didn't think about this when we were putting in uh, roads or houses, but we now know, and that's the good news is we can do something about it. I don't like showing these photos a lot, but I think it's really worth talking about that driving in general is has a moral cost that I don't think we've grappled with for both people 
and wildlife. I mean, just in California alone, we lose 4,000 people a year to our roads. If that was a disease or anything else, it would be a public health crisis. And then you look at the whole US and I forget that figure. Wildlife, I mean, it's one to 2 million that we know of big animals a year. And this was a personal experience I had. That's Billy the Bobcat. Doesn't he look dead in that photo? He got hit by a car near me. I went out and sat with him and it was horrendous. What a terrible death. You know, I'm going to talk about the science and why we needed to build these crossings for genetic isolation and connectivity. But let's also think of the suffering, the immense suffering that these animals are going through when they're hit by cars. It's a happy ending to Billy when he didn't immediately die. I got him in my car and got him to a rescue and he did have to have his leg amputated, but he is now at Critter Creek Wildlife Station and he, I get to go visit him. But to, to witness firsthand that animal suffering on the side of a road was quite eye-opening for me, even who works in connectivity. So I like to talk about the suffering that we are preventing with these crossings as well. Um, but let's get on to what I consider is the good news is we can do something. You know, this is a problem that we can solve. And as we know, the US is a little behind the rest of the world. Uh, some of these crossings like in Belgium and the Netherlands uh, and even Banff is the gold standard um, have been in for decades, but we're catching up in places like Colorado and Montana and Wyoming have had them for, for quite some time. Here's one in your area of the country that I visited, Highway 9 in Colorado. Um, this is such a great crossing. Trapper's Point, as I referenced before, and then Parley Summit in Utah. I love the, uh, you know, the videos that have gone up showing the, the breadth of animals that have used these. Uh, Washington State has a whole series of crossings. Some are done, some aren't. And then I haven't visited this one yet, but I'm looking forward to. This is the uh, land bridge in Texas, which is connecting two parks for both wildlife and people. So, uh, you know, we can solve this problem. Uh, I love amphibians, especially uh, frogs and toads. And one of my favorite crossings is the Yosemite Toad Crossing uh, right outside uh, Yosemite and Forest Service land. And the little Yosemite toads go under the road. So, you know, I work, happen to work on one of the biggest, uh, you know, charismatic megafauna, but I don't like to forget the little guys. Uh, so that's what I love about this problem. Like there's a lot of problems that it's really hard to get our, our heads around. How do we solve? Uh, but wildlife crossings, we know from decades of them, like I showed you, we know how to get animals across the road. We know what to do. We just really, in some respects, need the funding to do it. And so here's a success story I'll share with you and, and some of the ways we approached it a lot differently than a normal campaign, which is the Wallace Annenberg Wildlife Crossing. Um, this is in one of the most highly urbanized areas in the country, if not the world. Uh, it's Kardashians live right there. You're talking the most densely populated metropolitan center in the country. And we're going to put an intervention there. And here you see the, the crossing. This is, uh, I was lucky enough to go up into a plane and was able to see um, this from the air recently. That's where it's going. And then I have a little video that might be kind of fun to show.
the very low genetic diversity in our mount lions in the Santa Monica Mountains. There it is. I mean, it's it's super cool. Just, just 20 years working here, hiking, you know, pretty much all of these canyons. It's a great perspective from up in the air. Um, and being here, looking right over Liberty, it's, it's Liberty Canyon area. It's pretty amazing where the wildlife crossing will go. So here's a, a map you can see. This this sort of corridor funnels to literally the last 1600 feet where there's protected space on both sides of the 101. So what's interesting about this site, we know from 20 plus years of National Park Service study, the animals are already being funneled there. They're trying to use it. It's just such a formidable barrier. They're trying to turn around. And I think that's an important um, distinction as well. Roadkill, of course, is an excellent indicator of where you need crossings, but a lack of roadkill is as well. Avoidance is our issue. We actually don't get as much roadkill at Liberty Canyon because I wouldn't even try to cross it. I've been there at 2 a.m. and the 101 never slows 300 to 400,000 cars a day. So they just are like, uh, uh, and turn around. Our bigger problem is genetic isolation for animals, large and small, and plants. And as you know, we actually had birth defects starting to show up in our mountain lion population, which is what we're trying to solve for. Connect this ecosystem for all wildlife large and small, and even plants. Plants need movement to survive as well. Um, and so that's why we are kind of going off, uh, you know, off the playbook. Um, we, you know, wildlife crossing is designed purely for conveyance, which is a, a perfectly fine goal. You look at like the Utah crossing, they were trying to solve for a slaughter alley there, right? Animals were just getting hit. If you didn't put the crossing in, would the animals go extinct? Probably not. You just continue to have a pretty big problem. But that's what's a little different is we are trying to reconnect this ecosystem, the Santa Monica Mountains, which was effectively cut off from the rest of the world when this crossing went in. I mean, when the 101 went in, uh, we didn't know what we were doing at the time. So this is being designed so down to mimicking the ecosystem. We, I mean, we were collecting mushrooms two years ago. It's pretty much gonna be a continuous native flourishing ecosystem across the freeway. And as I pointed, we're not just designing it to get animals from A to B. You're gonna have ants and butterflies and lizards living on it. Uh, you might have a, you know, a fox family make their den on it. So this is what's really interesting. The other stuff we have to design for, which is a little different uh, than, or a big difference than some of those other crossings is the urbanization. Two, 300 to 400,000 cars a day come with light and sound pollution. And you can see on this diagram, the sound, vegetated sound walls we're having to put in as well. We have to kind of trick the animals to, you know, thinking they're not going across the freeway. This comes, of course, how we did it with amazing amount of partners from the five main ones were the National Park Service who did the research, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy who preserved the land, my organization, the National Wildlife Federation who led the education and public advocacy, and of course the fundraising, the uh, Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains who does immense habitat restoration and help with the early design. And then Caltrans, it was their road. And they're always like, hey, we wanna do this. We just, you know, get us the money. Um, here we are though. I mean, I'm speaking to you literally after 10 years of work where we broke ground uh, just a few weeks ago. There I am putting the shovel in the ground. You can watch the break ground ceremony at uh, savelacougars.org as well as download the commemorative booklet. But what a moment. I mean, what a moment uh, to do this. Everybody told us we were crazy. It couldn't be done. Um, and the press was everywhere. There was no shortage of press stories. But uh, this outlet, I think, uh, and this was a, a, a man named Dean, he was just amazing, captured to me what's special about this crossing, what I want you all to think differently about too. And he was referring to all the, what the speeches at groundbreaking were, were getting at, which is the urbanness uh, of this. Do you see the radical nature of what's being said? This is not the save the untrammeled wilderness ethos of Muir and Roosevelt in which we all take pride. This is a little more down and dirty. This bridge, like Schiff's Rim of the Valley edition, is about granting a kind of equality to wildlife that lives amongst the Los Angeles metro area's 13 million people. This is about building pumas and other creatures right into our dense city infrastructure, right into our lives. And I think that really sums up this change in conservation. It's not about just putting wildlife in a Yosemite, but it's about making sure we have room for them 
where we're at. And I know that's hard for a lot of people. I still get a lot of pushback. That is not, people in wildlife should not live together, put them, you know. But that gets us to P22, which I'll, in my time left, just get into is how we did this was really focused on this story that got at changing that value system. And I like to say the crossing is one outcome of the movement we created with Save LA Cougars, but really it's gonna help us with so much more with wildlife conservation in, con in, in coexistence. I think most of you know the story of P22. Here's Steve Winter's uh, photo that made him famous. He lives in the middle of Los Angeles. Here's some great video footage of him. He crossed two of the busiest freeways in the country that I don't even like to drive on to find a new home in Griffith Park because mountain lions are very territory needy and don't live alone. Um, and wow, I mean, I just still, I, I've retraced his journey, can't even believe what he did. This shows you the urban density he's living in. This is not, you know, outside of LA, it's in the middle of LA. And uh, perhaps not surprisingly, he stayed there because he's like, uh-uh, not doing those freeways again. Here's some uh, photos of him recently. So you see still a very handsome cat. Uh, he decided to take a stroll down Sunset, which was really in the urban core uh, a few months ago. Um, but LA has embraced him. And, you know, it's not fear that he makes the news. It's because people love him. The LA Times just did like a full celebrity spread on him. And people will text me at two in the morning. Hey, I saw P22. Just want to make sure he's okay. Not what I think you're probably all accustomed to, which is I'm afraid there's a mountain lion in the area. And I think he shows that coexistence is possible. Is it zero risk with him? Of course not. But People have put the risk in perspective and he's figured it out, but it's not exactly a happy ending for him. This is what he faces every night and he, he'll never have a girlfriend, um, probably uh, just because he's isolated in this park, but he's made it work much like the people of LA have. And, and that's what I love about his story is it's put almost a really human story, last of his kind, dateless battler. And that's why we compare him to Brad Pitt a lot. Um, he is the Brad Pitt of the cougar world. And I love this uh, story uh, that LAist ran uh, frequently. And we do who's hotter, Brad Pitt or P22 on our Facebook page. And this gets at another approach. Make it real. Get over that anthropomorphizing is bad. I'm a scientist, but it's okay to anthropomorphize. And indeed, this is how people relate to him outside of the conservation world. We've had celebrities. My favorite was Viggo Mortensen, um, Governor Gavin Newsom. Can you imagine another governor treating out part E22? No, right? But this is how you build a movement. Uh, you get an emotion. You need the science to back you up, but you get at the emotion and the love. And he's just beloved all over the world. We have a day dedicated in his honor, P22 day. We had 9,000 people show up at the last one. We have Warren Dixon, a rapper from Watts, has a P22 song. We have students doing dances and plays. The Black Pumas played one year. Um, but to me, this is it. And I think if I want to leave you as one thought, this is how you build a movement and get big ambitious things or even little ambitious things done. Get people excited about it. Bring them in. Um, you know, people advocate for us. And that's why we get the notice of big donors in the press. We're not just some environmentalists behind closed doors. We're probably up to two billion now with uh, the groundbreaking. This is before it. Um, but hey, I got the receipts. It works. We've raised $97 million to date with this approach. So think about it. Think about how you can be more inclusive in your movement. Think about how you can do things differently, like a rap song or the Black Pumas or whatever it is. Know that we have to reach more people. And those people have just as much a right to participating in this as, again, the traditional environmentalists. The other saying I'll end with is we have a saying in our campaign, slap a kitten on it. If all else fails, kittens or puppies or baby animals always works. And here's my contact information. I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for that, Beth. That was wonderful. I love the uh, the pictures too. I'm like one of those people that needs the cute kitten picture. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna bring Michelle back. There we go. And whenever you're ready, Michelle. Great. Well, thank you. That 
was a wonderful presentation. <laughs> Mine's not as beautiful as Beth's, but uh, yeah, Beth, that's incredible. Every time I hear it, I'm just, yeah, moved by your presentation. So awesome job. You guys have done just such a great like role model and such a great project to really inspire all of us. So yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let's see. Can you see that or not yet? It's not going into slideshow, is it? Oh, I'm not it seeing it in slides, but I am seeing the presentation. Let me stop sharing for a second. Oops, hold on one second. I seem to have something duplicated. Let me see. Give me one second. I'm going to unplug my other computer screens. There we go. Hold on. Nope. Sorry about that. I froze in a weird spot. Now let's try it. Sometimes when I have multiple computer screens, it messes up. It doesn't want to go into full mode, does it? What are you guys seeing? Um, we're seeing the presentation and the slides coming up on the left. There. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, I think it was my multi-screen. Well, sorry about that. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Michelle Corden. I am yep, the Wildlife Movement Coordinator with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And I'm going to give you a little bit of review of some things, efforts and conservation efforts going on here in Colorado and a couple examples of some transportation wildlife crossing projects that are um, one recently completed and a few that are uh, active, one active and one uh, planned or hopefully planned. Um, so this map I wanted to start with. So can you see the whole screen where it says existing wildlife crossing structures at the top, Chris? Where's the bar in the way? No, nope, I can see that. I'm gonna move, that. okay. So this map here, um, Last year we got with CDOT and we had we mapped all of our existing wildlife crossing structures. And I honestly was surprised when you map them all, we actually have over 60 existing dedicated wildlife crossing structures in Colorado. Some of these date back to the 70s, 80s, and there may be standalone culverts that were designed for wildlife. Um, they maybe don't have wildlife fencing and um, aren't really a series of structures, but they are out there on the landscape. And some of these older ones don't quite function as well as we would like, but we do have them on the landscape in addition to uh, numerous other underpasses and culverts and bridges that wildlife use every day. <clears throat> we do have this wildlife crossing map and now my mouse doesn't have any technical, there we go, I'll do this. And, um, you can find this on our website or CDOT's website. And when you click on the structures, it pulls up a picture and many pictures associated with the structure and a little bit of information about when the structure was built and um, maybe what the target species was. So that resource is available to everyone. So there's, you know, why are we concerned about building wildlife crossing structures in Colorado. And many of you probably already know this, but we documented that there's around 4,000 reported wildlife vehicle collisions or WVCs in Colorado. But we estimate there's probably upwards of 14,000 or more animals that are killed on our roadways every year that go unreported or not detected. And that's costing you know, people in Colorado upwards of $80 million in property damage and medical expenses, and sometimes people's lives are lost in colliding with wildlife on the roadway. Um, and we also have started to look at what's the value of loss to wildlife, not just the property dam damage and the impact on people. We estimate that to be around $24 million in wildlife value that's lost. Um, 
And we currently have, um, CDOT does have a 10 year plan. And on that, they have 25 projects that are dedicated to wildlife mitigation. And though that has a current estimate of being $25 million to complete those projects. And I'm sure that cost has gone up with um, the inflation that's happening and just the uh, delay in demand and supply and that type of thing, or de delay in supply based on demand. And then also we have this other factor that's coming, which is this population growth. Uh, we're probably going to see an increase of 68% in Colorado's population in the next 30 years. And so this is kind of getting at where, where, you know, what Beth was talking about around the LA region, right? We're going to start seeing a lot of our open areas be more confined with development. And we're going to start seeing more of our highways becoming more like interstates where their traffic volumes are just barriers to wildlife to even attempt to cross. Some of the solutions that have been happening back in 2017, uh, CPW, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and Colorado Department of Transportation or CDOT held a summit. And um, this summit related or formed, um, formed the Wildlife Transportation Alliance here in Colorado. And the Alliance is a collaboration of many partners, nonprofits, um, agencies um, that are involved in providing in safe passage for people and wildlife in Colorado. And we're working together to kind of promote these projects. Also what was happening in 2019, uh, the governor signed an executive order. And this was the first time that this had been, uh, something like this had been done where it was an executive order about conserving Colorado's big game winter range and migration corridors. And it really focused on CDOT and Colorado Parks and Wildlife working together to um, collect better data, identify where we want some of these wildlife crossing projects to go, where are the priority areas and about funding and that, and how do we get funding for these projects? And so we've been working closely with CDOT for years, but most recently in the just three or four years, we've really formed a much stronger relationship. The executive order also required Colorado Parks and Wildlife to do a big game status report, which we completed in 2020, talks about our big game herds and some of the threats and um, also some of the data gaps and solutions to kind of bridging that gap and keeping our wildlife and our big game herds healthy. And then that was followed by a policy plan that um, DNR just put out. And this has over 55 recommendations on how we can improve connectivity in Colorado. And this, again, kind of what Beth was getting to, it addresses concerns with recreation, transportation, human development growth, um, oil and gas, energy development. So all of these impacts are kind of um, chipping away at our wildlife habitat and our connectivity and the ability for them to move on the landscape um, as our populations grow and as we kind of recreate more and get more into the backcountry and that type of thing and drive more. So uh, this plan has several uh, recommendations in it. The other thing that um, CDOT and CPW have co-funded were two prioritization studies one that focused on the western slope of Colorado and one on the eastern slope. So the western slope of Colorado is uh, very mountainous and then it goes into kind of more of a sagebrush rangeland. And the eastern plains is just that, it's more foothills down to the grasslands as it goes to the east. So we completed two of these plans um, and these plans identified these kind of hotspot areas. And these maps here just show you where those hotspots are on our highways. This just was looking at our highways and looking at our wildlife vehicle collisions and our animal movement data, looking at some future risk models. And these both these studies combined have identified over probably close to 150 high priority highway segments that are shown here in red in just the top 5% of the projects. 
So we have all, we have projects, I mean, there are needed projects all throughout the state, but these are just our highest priority areas. And this is where right now we're focusing some of our efforts, not all of our efforts, but this is kind of help, helping to guide us where should we be focusing our limited funding and resources. Uh, this is really exciting. This was just um, passed. This just passed last week. And I think it was last week. And it'll be signed here in the next week or two, hopefully, by the governor. But this was a bipartisan bill. It's called the Safe Crossings for Colorado Wildlife and Motorists. And this is SB 151. And this bill was introduced on a bipartisan support. And it, it provides a fund for wildlife crossing projects into the future. And it creates this wildlife safe passage fund. And what's great about this fund is not only has, um, has, has it dedicated uh, $5 million towards wildlife crossing projects, but it also just creates a fund where now we can accept donations and grants and other funding can go into this fund and we can use it for future projects. But um, the legislation did approve $5 million. And uh, right now we're working on how best to use that funding. It'll probably be used for match for different grants and that type of thing. Um, but this is really great to see this type of support and commitment from the state. This map is just a uh, just kind of a to demonstrate where we have some of our crossing structures uh, that are more highly effective for wildlife shown in green and that were created, you know, built in the last 20 years. The pink stars, those are our active projects. And so just to give you an idea of what we're doing currently around the state of Colorado. On I-25, they just completed four large span bridges, um, and they're proposing to build a 200-foot wide overpass. So this is going to be comparable in size to what they're building out for and by um, LA for uh, P-22 and all of his friends. So this is uh, proposed and funding is being sought right now to build this wildlife overpass on I-25. This stretch has gone from um, this is, uh, this stretch went from a three, I think it was a two lane to a three lane highway recently. We also have, um, down here on highway 160 by Durango and Pagosa Springs, actually, um, we have our third wildlife overpass that is under construction and an underpass that's being built up in the Northwest portion of the state on highway 13. We have a wildlife underpass, and we also have a wildlife radar detection system that's going to be installed. And so we're gonna test a radar system that will identify as deer and elk and other animals approach the highway, and it'll turn on some flashing lights and uh, notify motorists that there's animals approaching the highway. On I-70 by Floyd Hill, Right now, there's um, some design discussions happening about building a bighorn sheep overpass by Empire and then over by Genesee doing an underpass on I-70. <clears throat> and then we have um, under construction currently uh, our six wildlife underpasses on West Vale, and I'll talk about those uh, here a little bit later. So to start, I just want to focus on a couple projects. I want to focus on our State Highway 9 project, which is the dot with all the, uh, the green dots right there. And then I'll also go and following that, I'll talk about the Westvale project. <laughs> so State Highway 9, um, Beth also mentioned this. Um, this was completed in 2016. This project consisted of five underpasses, large wildlife underpasses, and two overpasses. Um, the, the map shows all the wildlife vehicle collisions between 2005 and 2016, 2015. So the whole area was red with uh, wildlife vehicle collisions, mostly mule deer. And you can see it's in winter range. So animals come down in October and they're there through August or April, sorry. 
So the project had five underpasses and two overpasses, and we documented over 17 different species successfully using these crossing structures. And here you can see we've got bighorn sheep, pronghorn, deer, moose, elk, um, all those animals. We also had numerous kind of large and small mammals from bears and lions, bobcats, coyotes. We even had a couple of river otters use these structures. This graph here just shows the, uh, the total number of mule deer, that total number of successful passages by mule deer on these structures. So we had over 112 successful passages during our monitoring uh, research phase, and that was from 2015 to 2020. So over those five years at the seven structures, um, that's 112,000 times, you know, a mule deer didn't have to cross the highway. So um, again, not individual mule deer, some mule deer are making daily movements or multiple movements per day. We also saw a 90% decrease in our wildlife vehicle collisions, both carcasses and uh, carcass counts and crashes that were reported by our uh, law enforcement. So it was 90 to 92% uh, decrease. So I'm gonna move on to Westvale Pass. I wanna leave time for questions here. So Westvale, this is looking west towards the town of Vale from the uh, above the pass. You can see how the highway just crosses and connects or splits through forested area on both sides of the highway. This is uh, forest service property. Um, what's planned here is uh, on this stretch, they're gonna be adding additional lanes to the highway, which they're currently under construction. And part of the mitigation is to build six underpasses, two large underpasses and four smaller underpasses. The larger underpasses will be for our elk and our deer and the smaller underpasses are gonna be for critters like lynx. So we know that we have lynx in this area. Back in 2010 and 2011, um, US Forest Service had some animals radio collared and we know that they're successfully crossing I-70 in some areas and in some areas they're approaching and not crossing. We also know that in 1999 and 2004, we had two lynx that were hit on this stretch of I-70. And so we know that we have had some mortality uh, on this highway for lynx. And so we'll be building four small underpasses uh, for lynx. I wanted to touch quickly on the Eastvale Pass. So this is on the other side of the pass by Copper Mountain and Rocky Mountain Wild is a, a strong supporter and a partner in this project. What you have here is the eastbound lanes. You have some connectivity with these existing span bridges you can see on the right and the westbound lanes on the left. It's just, there's no ability for animals to safely cross. And so Summit County Safe Passages is a collaboration of many different local nonprofit and agency partnerships. And they're currently working on um, the concept of building two large underpasses and one large overpass on the westbound lanes to provide connectivity along this stretch. Because we know based on Rocky Mountain Wild's work that, um, and the US Forest Service that L or, um, links do cross the highway and that they are successfully crossing at this time. But in the future, um, you know, it could, it, we may not be as fortunate. This is just an example, just to show you what the wildlife overpass will look like. So this is a unique design. It would um, cross from the west side down to where the bike path is into that median. So this is coming. Um, there's a link there at the bottom if you're interested in supporting this project. I'm sure if you're members of Rocky Mountain Wild, you've heard about some of the county safe passages and the East Vale project. Just some additional efforts that we're doing here in Colorado. We are currently uh, conducting a movement analysis and mapping effort of all of our GPS collar data for deer and our elk. And that's in the process. And this is gonna help us really hone in on where those high priority movement areas are. And then also to, um, to collect better data, CPW and CDOT have worked together to design a roadkill app. This is not available to the public. It's only used by the agencies but we're starting to improve the data that we're collecting to identify where all species are being hit along the highway. 
primarily deer, elk, moose is another big one and several mountain lions, unfortunately. And then there is a website on Colorado Parks and Wildlife's, uh, you can, there's a web page on Colorado Parks and Wildlife website. It's the movement and migration web page. And here there's a lot of different links and information that's available um, that I've talked about today. And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, opening it up to questions, we had one in the, well, first of all, thank you both <laughs> so much for your presentations and for being here today. Um, we had one question in the registration um, from Stephen. Stephen asked, are there plans for Highway 93? I'm gonna ask, where is Highway 93? Is it, Stephen, is that by, uh... Aspen, the 82. Um, it doesn't look like Stephen's on the line today. Does Paige, do you know where 93 is? Honestly, I would say probably not because I don't, and I know where most of the highways are. That's why I'm wondering, I could Google that real quick. So some of our priority project areas, what I can tell you is for Colorado, uh, obviously up by Craig in the Northwest corner, we have a lot of road kills in that area. That's Highway 40, uh, State Highway 13. Uh, more areas down by 550, by Durango, you know, East, North, Montrose, uh, Pagosa, some more down in that area. Um, I-25 potentially down South by Raton Pass several possibilities of doing projects, just even fencing to connect existing crossing, uh, existing bridges on parts of I-70, I-76, and then the um, I-70 corridor, what we've talked about today. Yeah, sorry, I don't know where 93 is. I don't know, maybe, I don't, sorry, that might be down by, on the front range. Yeah, uh, Paige says it looks like 93 connects Golden and Boulder. Oh yeah, uh, at this point, no, uh, nothing, nothing major anyways. They had done a radar system there, yep, at one point or some sort of break the beam system, but not at this point. Okay, um, Matt, you said you had a lot of questions. You wanna come on the line? Oh yeah, thank you so much. And I apologize, um, feel free to ignore uh, any questions that already were answered. I forgot that this was one of the webinars that started earlier than um, noon, so I, I just tuned in at 12, but um, I was curious, Michelle, uh, is there, are there any existing maps of the historic migration corridors for different wildlife species and then like how those have changed since um, uh, European settlement uh, or European yeah, colonization? Um, not that I'm aware of, but I mean, I'm sure somebody, I don't know about as far as migration going back that far pre-settlement, right? I mean, we have records of where animals were and, and kind of where they were hunted at different times of years by indigenous people, like in the spring or summer, like up by Rocky Mountain National Park. Uh, that would I'd have to look into that or be a good question for the museum. Denver Museum might have something along those lines. Yeah, I was just curious if like the state of Colorado is working off of like what is the baseline of like this is what healthy migration corridors would look like in the state and where we are given development. Um, so I don't know if like the state has a baseline or an understanding of like this is what wildlife need to be healthy and migrate effectively. Um, and this is what we're working towards, um, anything like that. I mean, I, I think we, through just kind of, you know, staff knowledge and studies, I mean, as far as how animals, what animals need to maintain healthy herds, especially based on some of our herd data that we collect every year, we understand kind of some of those impacts, but, Historically, you know, the only thing we kind of have is um, we 
have collected that information internally since the 80s and 90s, but it wasn't necessarily based on telemetry data. It was more observational data. Okay, thanks. I, I have some more questions, but I'll let others go. Um, do, does anyone have a question for Beth? I know Beth needs to go right at uh, noon 30. So if any questions for Beth? I'll, I got a few more minutes, but uh, I'm here. I, I'll ask one if no one else. I don't want to overtake the conversation, but um, Beth, you might have brought this up earlier. But is there are over and underpasses equivalent? Are they do they have the same benefits, or is one better for wildlife than the other for certain species? You know, that's a really good question, and I think it, it's every wildlife crossing is site and goal specific, right? So. Um, some species will use underpasses more, some species won't use underpasses or tunnels, right? Um, what the best thing in my mind, if you're looking for a whole solution like we were at Liberty Canyon, you know, if you mimic the ecosystem, everybody's going to use it for the most part or, or most folks, but that's not always feasible at every site. You might not have the same problem. Uh, I know you weren't here for my presentation, but we weren't solving a roadkill problem. We were solving a ecosystem isolation problem, which meant we had to connect it for everybody. So an overpass at that site made the most sense. We're basically just extending the, or bringing the landscape back where we cut it for the freeway. But if you're looking at a site where, okay, the mule deer are getting hit or the elk are getting hit, you know, that comes with a very different set of design parameters. Um, we actually looked at a tunnel. To tunnel under the 101 freeway, 10 lanes and an access road actually would have cost more. And you wouldn't have the connection for a lot of species and the plants, right? So you wouldn't have that ecosystem connection. So, to, you know, a short answer is there's no right or wrong answer. I mean, there are some wrong answers. If you just want to solve for the Yosemite toad and you built a, a bridge into the sky, wouldn't work. But it really is. A lot of them are very site and goal specific. What is your goal? And, and then what's feasible at, at the site? Thank you. Um, Sonia had a question. Could you talk a little bit more about the radar system and how it works? Sure. Um, the way I understand it, so what it, it's going to be, so up on Highway 13, what they did is uh, they have a high wildlife exclusion fence for about a mile, and then it drops down to a lower fence to allow animals to get across for about a half mile and then goes back into a high fence and a low fence. And they put the low fence sec sections um, in these straightaways for better driver visibility. And unfortunately in this area, for several reasons, um, we weren't able to construct an actual crossing structure. So how the radar system is going to work up there is it's between two high fence sections. So we basically created a half mile crosswalk in these lower fence section areas. And what the radar system is going to do, it's a 300, it can be like a 360 degree view, but it will, um, and it's being installed this year. So we haven't quite lined it all out, but it will, you identify what size target you want to track. So we can have it track from elk down to coyote and it'll track those animals and you set where your detection zone is and it's a radar, so it's constantly scanning. And then when it identifies a target, as we define that target, it starts to literally track all those animals as they move towards the highway. And then you have within the highway right away, outside the highway right away, you identify a um, zone that triggers the the radar to come, the flashing lights to come on. So it'll be tracking those animals as they approach the highway. When they get within some distance of the highway, the flashing lights will come on and warn the drivers there's an animal kind of in the area. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, Michelle. Um... Again, feel free, you you and Beth may have already addressed this, but I was curious about um, the science of fencing um, and how that impacts wildlife. Um, 
uh, has the science sort of found that, you know, sort of these long stretches of fencing on the interstate, does that create impacts to wildlife even with the underpasses, you know, that in, in a way like funnels them in a way that's can be detrimental to different species or has the science generally found that like those long stretches of fencing, so long as there are some sort of bridge or underpass or low fence are is okay for migration? Yeah, I, um, the large stretches with crossing structures, we've, ne we haven't seen any sort of impacts at population levels, right? That animals, um, you, you want to put them probably a mile and a half, a mile to a mile and a half distance. Um, you want to make sure that, you know, they're able to find those structures, but if they're able to find them, you know, there's no, we haven't identified any sort of impacts to populations. If you know that you have a set migration area, you, that's where you're going to want to put that crossing structure. You know, you don't really want to put it a mile away. If it's like State Highway 9, where the entire stretch was winter range and these animals were moving within their winter range throughout the year, we haven't seen any sort of impact at a population level. Um, there might be some sort of microsite, like plant level impacts, but it seems like the animals move through and then they go to where they want to move to. Um, I think to thinking about that these roads, you know, when they're low enough volume, you have roadkill. And then when the volume of road gets to the point like I-70, you don't see roadkill because animals no longer cross the highway, right? They, uh, Rocky Mountain Wild has cameras up on East Vale. They have elk coming down to the highway. We don't get elk hit on I-70 very much anymore by Summit. And copper because they're not even trying to cross the highway. We're mostly getting bear and lions and moose hit on that stretch by copper because they're still attempting to cross, but our herd animals aren't even attempting. So it's a, it's a trade-off between like complete barrier of the highway versus making those animals move to your crossing structure. And if you can build the structure right and you provide the fencing to guide them there, then yeah, we don't see impacts at the population level. Thank you. Um, I had one, one or two other questions. The last maybe one is, um, has the state of Colorado, I know that they received this information, at least that's my understanding when I was living in Idaho, the state received information from the different railroad companies about uh, collisions from trains and wildlife. And um, I, my understanding was it wasn't insignificant and the species that were hit by train varied. Um, so it wasn't just mule deer, for example. Is that something that the state of Colorado tracks and that is being considered or or maybe it's not significant enough to warrant yeah. crossing structures? Well, I don't know of any data that we've ever been given because I don't think the railroad collects it. I do know that our staff, our district officers, go out frequently with um, the railroad crew when they, they're in contact with us when animals are injured on the highway and have to be put down, unfortunately. It is, it's probably not insignificant. Um, the challenge is so great, like we, it's not insurmountable, but it's to the, like we've had those discussions. How do we mitigate, not even just the railroad road, but when you have a highway or a road next to a railroad, right? And how would you even mitigate for both those features? Like the cost just goes up so high. I know that other states have been working with the railroads. They've looked at different types of systems um, outside of just crossing structures. So it's just one of those, it's like the, we haven't cracked that nut kind of thing, right? Like we know it's there, we wanna address it, but we haven't gotten to it. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. And, and think about the miles of railroad and... Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, and that's where like, I think a similar sort of mapping exercise, like are there priority areas on the track where their railroads reporting significant numbers of impacts. 
I know locally in the hot sulfur area, our officer this year, they actually, we've done it before, but uh, rot, would like actually went with the railroad a couple of times this winter and marked every carcass because it was, um, we had such a hard winter. It really depends on the severity of the winter. We haven't had this bad of a winter probably since 2007, 2008. So, um, yeah. We don't have to do a lot though, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Well, um, I won't, oh, sorry. So, well, I don't, I don't wanna bogart the conversation. I have one more question, but if you need to end it, that's totally fine. What do you think, Michelle, do you have time? Sure. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the last one was just a general question about CPW, but is it still, is it the case, I guess, that um, is the agency wholly funded by permits, like receipts from permits, or does it get uh, appropriations from the state? Uh, no, we are, we are, I wouldn't say fully funded in the sense that we do get federal funds also based on uh, grants, uh, Pittman and Robertson, that type of thing, so, which we've always received. But no, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is fully, we can say fully funded. We receive no general funds from the state. All of our money comes from the sale of licenses and or federal grants. Gotcha. Well, yeah, thank you for letting me know. I, it's impressive how much you're able to do. I, it still boggles my mind that those licenses can support as much like you, the, this infrastructure is expensive. So, well, a lot of this infrastructure, though, this is CDOT and it's federal highways and other grant mm. money. So CPW has provided some funding to these projects, but it's primarily um, CDOT and federal highways. And then okay. right now with the transportation infrastructure bill, you know, there'll be a lot of grant money coming in, but um, we we don't really fund the, the larger projects. We just work as a partner to identify, cite them and help design the projects. Gotcha, thank we you so much. We do do a lot of conservation easements. We put $10 million every year towards conservation easements. And that 10 million comes from the habitat stamp, which is uh, mostly paid for every time. Um, Every hunter and fisher person has to purchase a habitat stamp every year. And then now um, we're back to if you access any of our state wildlife areas, you have to have a habitat stamp. But it's primarily um, hunters and fisher people that are paying for those that $10 million. And that's just a drop of what we get from them. Yeah. And it's not doesn't go to parks like the parks is separate from the wildlife. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Michelle, for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Um, before folks go, I'm going to drop in the chat. Um, we have the last day of Colorado Endangered Species Week tomorrow. Um, and we also have some actions that you can take today uh, about uh, wildlife crossing structures um, on our page. So. Thank you everyone for joining us and big thank you to Michelle and Beth um, for sharing their knowledge with us. I'll be emailing out um, the information from the chat and uh, other resources. So thanks yeah. everyone. And Matt, feel free to reach out to me if you uh, want. Chris can drop my email in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, will do. Great. Thanks everyone. Bye.